But peace and blessings, everyone. And I'm so honored to have you on our Instagram live, Kat, um, and being part of this IG live, unveiling love, stories of community and social change. This is a space where community leaders and artists share their defining moments um, in shaping their efforts in creating peace and safety and solidarity in the community. Um, this podcast is part of a Love Over Fear Oakland campaign organized by our family at Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, defending humanity of immigrants and defending the incarcerated. Uh, we are at the intersection of faith, social movement, spirituality. This campaign is a response to the challenges that are faced by the communities of color in Oakland. We acknowledge the root causes that disrupt the safety community collaborations. Uh, so artists and creatives like myself was brought onto this campaign to really cultivate connections within the Black AAPI and Chicano community through art, spirit, history. You know, talking about creating connections, designing and producing community resources and programs, unearthing root causes, uh, of the issues that we face is really a true work of healing. And when I think the work of healing, I think of women on the front line, women that are in love with this mission that offer a unique leadership of resiliency, grace, compassion, devotion, insight, empathy. In the Nation of Islam, we're taught that a nation can rise no higher than its women. And behind every great women, great movement, there's great women leadership. And, you know, today I have a wonderful guest that is a great example of this leadership, co-founder of Anti-Police Terror Project, APTP, host of Law and Disorder on 94.1, KPFA. She's an award-winning artist, actress, playwright, poet, theater artist. Her work was displayed at the Oakland Museum of California. She's one of the leading national voices movement to redirect resources from law enforcement toward community process for public safety. With ATP, ATPT, excuse me, she launched Oakland and Sacramento's first and only non 9-11 response to mental health crisis model called Mental Health First. And she's also made a great impact in education She's truly a reflection of the values and history of Oakland. Thank you, Kat. Welcome to IG Live. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, what, what a time to be talking about love over fear. Um, yes. There's so much fear mongering happening um, and, you know, in attempts to manipulate our people. Um, and, and push political agendas uh, through terror. And so anytime we get to talk about healing justice, root causes, love, um, keeping us safe, how we keep us safe, all the beautiful ways we do that, I'm excited to have that conversation. So I'm glad we got it together. Yes, <laughs> I You know, um, speaking about love, you really do display the work of love and inspire me and others. Um, and how to do the work, you know, rooted in love. And I want folks to kind of know a little bit more about you. Um, can you tell us a bit of your background um, and how you got started in this work? Like what was the moment that inspired you to take the first step in creating and doing this work in the community? Um, well, I can't say it was one moment. So I was raised, I think folks that know me know, I was born and raised in Las Vegas. Um, and um, my father was the first black stagehand ever um, in a city that was segregated. Um, Las Vegas, um, I always tell people for context, was founded by cowboys, the Mormons, and the mob. Um, mm -hmm. My mother was on the front lines of the domestic violence movement. Um, we also had a test site uh, very close to Las Vegas. And so um, early on, um, in, engaged in black indigenous organizing as we tried to take that test site back. Um, I put it back into the hands of the indigenous people from which it was stolen. Um, I grew up watching my father get beat up by the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department and my mother um, fight cowboys literally um, to, to protect the lives of women um, that were being murdered at pretty high rates. Las Vegas still remains one of the um, 
cities in the world where we have the highest rates of violence against women um, in this country. I grew up watching my mother. She would take a friend with us, and, and she would put me with a friend, and she would cross the line and take a rest, um, which is was hilarious because, like, 20 years later, right, she's, like, cussing me out for getting arrested, and I was like, you know, uh, these are the values I was raised with. Um, my father ended up in the penitentiary um, for substance abuse issues. Um, and I, I knew even as a kid um, that, that a cage was not going to make him better. Like, I knew he, I literally used to talk about, like, it was my father was sick, right? Um, I think the other piece to, to understand is, is, is how deeply racist and, and violent um, Las Vegas is. Um, I grew, I was there in the 90s, right, where across the country we saw a resurgence of the white supremacy movement um, and an uptick in violence against black and brown and queer bodies. And in Las Vegas, 86 means eight feet out and six, uh, eight miles out and six feet deep. Uh, and that's where they took uh, uppity Negroes like me um, and that ever-present, right, threat uh, of the violence of law enforcement. Um, it, and I was just, I was raised in a home where, right, you, you were of service to, to the people and to the community and that we were always engaged in political conversation and struggle. Um, I'm an actress, and that's what I went to L.A. to do. Um, and I ended up working for a community coalition uh, founded by now mayor of Los Angeles, Karen Bath. Her politics were a little different uh, back then. Um, she probably twitches whenever she hears me say, you know, without Karen Bass then, there's no Cab Brooks now, um, even though we're so far uh, apart now on the political spectrum. But I've been an organizer my whole life, and I worked on a bunch of stuff, everything from education reform um, to land use um, to it interrupting uh, sex trafficking. Um, and then, you know, um, 2009, um, January 1st, 2009, uh, Oscar Grant was murdered. Uh, executed on the Fruitvale BART platform. And for the last 15 years of my life, that was the defining moment. Mm -hmm. um, seeing that video, watching that video as I held my daughter in my arm, um, who she was two uh, then. And um, yeah, not, nothing. I, I mean, I didn't, I, it was one of those moments where I knew I had, I had, I had been changed. Um, I didn't know what that was going to mean. I, I certainly no way could have imagined uh, the what I was about to walk. But for this for this work, uh, it was Oscar's execution, um, and remains Oscar's execution um, that that grounds me. Um, and inside of work that is really less about response and more about refusal, refusal that this is a paradigm we have to accept. Uh, refusal that our only option is to protest, refusal um, that we have to accept this as the status quo for our people. Right, right. Thank you. Yeah, I remember that moment. It also, it, it just, it tore me apart. And I was always like looking for what are, other, like this, this is not right. This, this can't be right. So, you know, as a co-founder of um, Anti-Police Project, you guys, shared a report um, that the Oakland Police Department uh, consumes almost 50% of Oakland in general fund annually, yet the community continues to lack adequate protection and support. Can you share on why this is? I mean, I think it's important for us to understand it's not just Oakland, right? This is municipalities uh, across the country that have been sold the lie um, that police keep us safe. I mean, from the t like we all remember that moment, right? When the cop came into our elementary school room and, and we got the, the, the sticker. And for, for black folks, for brown folks, AAPI folks, particularly those of us who lived um, in impoverished communities, right? It, it literally created, creates a cognitive dissonance, right? You're told that these are the people that you call for safety, um, that these are your friends, that they're gonna get your cat out of the tree. Um, and you're told this at school, and then you are criminalized all the way home. Um, and, and then you also exist in this world where, you know, they beat up your daddy, they arrest your auntie, uh, they're an occupying army in your community, um, they're harassing you for walking down the street. For women of color, sexual assault is the primary way that we experience state violence. Um, and, and yet, um, the power of propaganda uh, is real. 
Um, so even though we know that they don't keep us safe, we continue to invest in this failed strategy of public safety. Um, it's important for us to understand that law enforcement agencies, they're the front lines, right, mm -hmm. to, to, to protect and make sure that we don't disrupt the status quo too much. Um, their job is to uplift and uphold race-based capitalism. The very first police officers in this country uh, were the cavalry, slave catchers, and union busters, right? That was their job, to protect profit over people. Um, and they continue to do that work, and they continue to do that job. And there are folks that make lots and lots of money um, over them doing their job in that way. Um, and, and so we're, in this, we're stuck in this vicious cycle um, where we are consistently being lied to. We are consistently investing resources that could be um, invested in things that actually keep us safe. That data, right? It's not just Cat Brooks. The data shows housing, health care, living wage jobs, good education, college degrees, um, mental health supports, trauma supports, uh, whole connected families, right? However those are made up. Those are the things that actually keep us safe. The communities with the most resources are the safest communities. Mm -hmm. The communities with the least amount of resources and the most police are the least safe communities that we have, um, not just here in Oakland, but across the country. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So we're speaking about resources. Um, we're midway through the 2025 budget, mid-cycle, and the city council has, you know, in the end of June to approve the mid-year budget. What are the priorities the mayor should be prioritizing? I, I, the, the, fir the first thing I want to say, because I think it's really important for the narrative that, that is moving, uh, making its way through the town right now, um, is that, yes, we are absolutely in a multi-million dollar deficit. Um, and this is not a defense of Shang Tao. Uh, Shang and I differ wildly on um, what I think she should be investing in in terms of public safety. That said, this isn't her fault. Right. She was handed um, this disaster of a budget um, by the previous mayor who now is running to be the treasurer of the state, which is like lightweight, terrifying. Um, and so I think we have to hold that context. Right. Um, that doesn't mean that we stop towing the line. Right. So APTP gave birth to defund in the city of Oakland in 2015. We have been a part of coalitions that have included labor, grassroots organizations, progressive electeds, um, impacted family members, folks coming home from jails and prison, um, folks that, that care about our potholes, folks that care about the environment, right? Folks that care about our after school programs. And what we have seen, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, no every year, right, is that those are all the things that get cut. But the one line item that never gets cut and that actually increases every single year. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's the, the start of the new budget cycle or when we get to man, we're talking about revisions, is the Oakland Police Department. Every single department inside of the city of Oakland uh, has been told that they have to cut their budgets by 20 percent. Um, and so for us, when we think about um, what we're going to fight for, and I wanted to shout out Deputy Director James Birch, who has really been the brainchild between, uh, behind Defund, um, helping translate right really wonky budget concepts and information to the people so that they're empowered to advocate for the things that matter. Like we're thinking about um, who who do we have to go to bat for, right? And so we're we're talking about macro. We're talking about the Department of Violence Prevention. Um, we're talking about uh, traffic calming infrastructure um, that are going to keep our our, our our streets safe. Um, so if, if you think about like the de the Department of Violence Prevention, right? And violence prevention means that the crime doesn't happen in the first place, which is, should be what we're trying to get. Um, and we think about the types of organizations that are funded through um, that department, which isn't very well funded, right? You're, we're talking about things like Centro de Legal. We're talking about things like the Transgender Law Center. We're talking about violence interrupters, right? Like those are the things that we should be prioritizing. Um, my crystal ball says that every single department is going to have to make cuts. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, that's where the trickle down theory actually does uh, come come into effect, right? The programs are cut and the, the pain trickles down uh, to us or, or rushes down uh, via an avalanche to us. And if I had to, if I had to bet dollars to donuts, the Oakland Police Department is once again going to be the only department that does not have to cut its budget. Um, and, and in part because of the political climate that we're in and, and what we're seeing our electeds react to and make decisions based off of. 
Um, and so I, I think with the false narrative that OPD was defunded, that Leron Armstrong went all over the country and lied about, um, mm -hmm. with the scare tactics that are blaming uh, a defund that never happened and criminaliz crim criminalizing um, our black and brown young people as opposed to putting the responsibility for the conditions squarely on the shoulders of the economic pandemic that came on the heels of the coronavirus pandemic, um, instead of trying to course correct and right those wrongs, um, it's going to be a really painful budget um, season and, and such, and even more so, um, I think, than previous years, um, which also means that we have to organize more so. We've got to be knocking on doors more so. We've got to be mobilizing our people um, to City Hall, right, to, to call into these council meetings, to engage their elected for the folks that are getting ready to run again, to let them know, right? Um, your, 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 your seat ain't safe and my vote ain't guaranteed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if the Oakland Police Department is the only department in the entire city that you all are going to invest in, we're going to have to invest in some other folks that are going to be committed to investing in us. That's right. That's right. Yes. Um, you know, when you think about police keeping us safe, I think about like the case with Angel Quinto and Christian Hall, like victims of mental health crisis, you know, and you actually, you know, with again, with ATPT uh, has created uh, a beautiful example of community program, Mental Health First. Can you tell us how that came about and what is the current status of the model um, for domestic violence in organizing that with survivors? Like what's, what's going on with that? Yeah, sure. So we gotta go all the way back, back right? So in 2010, around 2010, 2011, um, folks started calling us to respond to community crisis. Um, to mental health crisis, to intimate partner violence, um, to substance abuse issues, uh, if cops were, you know, jacking up our community members, right, folks were hitting us up on social media. And so we were doing it informally for a long time, um, about a decade. Um, the other piece of context is that APTP was born to to not just be reactionary, but to be visionary. Like I said, to blow up the paradigm that we have to accept this. Um, and moving with the information, the knowledge, the understanding that the only way that we're gonna reduce or eliminate state violence from our communities is to reduce or eliminate engagement between our communities and the state. Um, Asantwa Boykin, who is one of the co-founders of APTP, is also a registered nurse um, who spent the majority of her nursing career um, really at the intersection of mental health crisis and black bodies and watching the violence uh, of the state in responding um, to that crisis. And then in 2015, we call it bloody 2015, 11 black men were murdered with impunity in the city of Oakland. Uh, and then right on the heels of that, Celeste Guap um, came out and let us know, know that she had been raped and trafficked by multiple law enforcement agencies across the Bay Area. And like those two moments, I remember standing actually with, with, with James Birch and, and we were doing one of my favorite actions that we've ever done, which was um, our allies were scaling the flagpoles outside of the Oakland Police Department and taking down their flags and putting up flags that said OPD or rap rapist. Um, they were really, really mad. Um, but I was also really, really mad, right? And uh, I remember standing there, I was smoking a cigarette, and, and I said to James, I said, so what the fuck are we paying him for? Um, and then James, being the G that he is, went and found out what we were paying them for and what we were getting in response uh, for all of those millions of dollars. And, and defund was born, and defund was born with the demand that 50% of the Oakland Police Department department's budget be redirected to 24-7 mental health crisis and that we as APTP would be given the funds to be able to develop a model of response to community crisis that did not lead with the carceral state. Um, and they laughed us out of chambers for years. Um, and then so we just decided to build it ourselves, <laughs> um, right, which, which is really what we all should be doing uh, in response to the crisis we see in our communities. And so we launched Mental Health First in 2020, first in Sacramento uh, and then in Oakland. Uh, folks will know that we launched it in the middle of a pandemic. Um, that's not how we were designing it because we did know the pandemic was coming, but we launched in the middle of the pandemic. 
Um, and since that time, we have trained upwards of 7,000 people across the country. Um, we don't, you know, anybody is welcome to take our training. It's not about creating a whole bunch of mental health first, because what works in Oakland ain't going to work in Piedmont. What works in Piedmont ain't going to work in San Francisco, right? But what we do transfer is values, principles, and structure. Um, and so we're trying to spread that love as rapidly and widely as we can. We believe that the way that we get to new paradigms of safety are to create replicable models um, uh, by, for, and of the people. Call the data, uh, make it better. Um, because if, if, if the people don't see an actual alternative pathway to safety, then they're going to stay over here in this thing that doesn't keep them. Uh, very safe. So that actually is the most important work. So, so yeah, we used to say we were the only non nine one one response to community crisis. Now I have to say uh, non nine one one or non nine one one adjacent because nine eight eight is on the scene now. Um, my opinion about nine eight eight is that that gained traction and steam in order to co opt um, programming uh, and services that were working. Um, for the people uh, and that were developed by the people. And there's some really scary data about how often folks that answer that hotline call the police on our people. Um, so, so yeah, and, and we were also really instrumental in the design of macro, holding macro accountable. And I don't give the city of Oakland very many props, but I will say um, that macro was one of the best models of a city run um, non-carceral community crisis response model that, that exists. And that's in large part because of the work that all of us did together uh, to make sure that it was reflective of what we wanted and needs. That's, right. that's right. And where are we with the uh, model for domestic violence? Sure, so, uh, gosh, and I can't think how many years it's been now. Um, Daniel Robello, uh, who has been a longtime APTP volunteer that's now um, on our comms team, um, and I set out to um, develop this model of non cross response and with partner violence. I'm a survivor of domestic violence. I'm also a survivor of state interference into that domestic violence, meaning that my husband beat the crap out of me and then I went to jail, um, which happens to, to women and impacted people every day, um, which also means that there's like large swaths of people that really need help that will never call that number again and who suffer in silence. Um, and so we interviewed survivors. We may, uh, engaged in partnerships with frontline organizations that shared our values. Uh, Danielle is an amazing designer. Uh, we researched, we took stories, we asked people what they needed. Mm -hmm. um, it was a really long process. And so we've released this guide um, that walks people how to do non carceral uh, response to, to intimate partner violence, right? My mother would have been considered a carceral feminist. Um, at the time that she was doing the work, um, I, I asked people to give the women from 40 or 50 years ago a pass because it was the extent it was nothing. Women were just dying. Um, and, right, the impact, particularly on black and brown and indigenous communities, has been horrific. Um, and, and what we've done in this country is we've taken people that have learned to express their trauma through violence, and then we throw them into the most violent institutions in the world, and we spit them back out. Right, and it's this vicious cycle. Um, so we've designed this model. Um, we really, really want to build it here in Oakland. Unfortunately, the funding um, for this kind of work, uh, domestic violence, is little to none. Um, the largest pot of money for DV work are the VAWA dollars at the, the federal level. They, they, that, that, those dollars are just dramatically cut, and most of those dollars um, mean that the organization is required to work with law enforcement. Um, so there wasn't very much money. The money that existed, you had to do co-response models. Now that money, right, has been cut in half. Um, and so it's just, it, it's been rough to, to get it off the ground. And, and also like the the changing the, the public debate about intimate partner violence, right? Like people, it, it wasn't a completely, uh, completely a cakewalk, but people could really get to a place where, Cops should not be responding to people that are, right, not sharing our reality. Right. Cops should not be responding to people that, you know, are, are, are in a state of trauma, especially if we look at the numbers and that more than 50% of the people that cops murder uh, have a disability. But you start talking about cops should not be responding 
to air, you know, issues of violence um, that usually have, you know, people that identify as women as the, the receivers of their violence. I got abolitionists in my crew that are like, yeah, no, nah, fuck you, cat. I, <laughs> I, they can go under the jail. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, we're walking two roads. We're, we're, we're trying to raise funds and we're also trying to impact the public debate and show folks, right? Like we've been incarcerating folks. Three women a day, three women every however many minutes it is, right. die in this country because of violence at the hands of someone they know. So clearly something that we're doing isn't working. That's right. And, you know, with all that's going on from even COVID to our young, the youth protesting in the colleges and the, you know, the anti uh, what's going on with, with Palestine and the war and the genocide. Like, I, I'm thinking about the issue of mental health and how we're going to have to face trauma from all of what's going on in our community. And I think about the importance of international struggle and international solidarity. What's going on right now on college campuses and everywhere around the world? How does this define help us look at what's going on in our community um, and guide us better in this work? How can we make that connection so we can do the work here in our local communities in rooting in, in, in love? I mean, this is Oakland, right? The birthplace of the Black Panther Party and the party taught us um, international struggle, international solidarity, international liberation. That's the only way we get there. Um, the importance of intersectionality, right? They were talking about intersectionality um, before the amazing Kimberly Crenshaw popularized that concept. Um, the most powerful work that we can that we can do and should do is at the local level, right? That's where we can build the deepest relationships with our people. Um, that we can be engaged in acts of service, that we can be engaged in acts of solidarity, that we can do political education. But all of that work then has to be connected, right, to comrades, issues, relationships across the globe, right? We have to understand, for instance, that part of why folks that in, in, in this country that, that care about police violence also need to care about the violence of the IDF and the IOFs because they actually cross-train each other. Right. So when we're talking about cop cities, we're talking about very intentional plans for this cross training to happen. Right. To, to, to so that they can use the violence of the state to maintain um, a, 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 a second class uh, group of citizens to put down uh, more effectively, more violently, more swiftly resistance, uh, protest, uh, dissent. Um, we have to understand when we're talking about climate change, right, that the folks that are going to feel that the most are black and brown people in the flats of Oakland and then connect that to the jobs that are already happening to black bodies on the continent, right? When we're talking about gender-based violence, we have to connect the, the what I was just talking about here, right, the high rates of women that are murdered every single day at the hands of their partners to the brutal rape of women that are happening in the Congo. Right. And, and connecting all those dots and building those relationships. And that actually is what the state and by the state, I'm talking about the global state right now is so terrified mm -hmm. about. That's that, that is part of why they, they actually right, are d doubling down. That is why Joe Biden is literally throwing out <laughs> his chances of winning uh, the presidential this year because it's more important for them to double down on destroying mm. the solidarity, the movement, the passion, um, the power of the, the, the youth. Um, the, the intergenerational organizing um, and, and resource sharing that is happening right now. This is a very dangerous moment for Zionism. It's a very dangerous moment for white supremacy. It's a very dangerous moment for race-based capitalism. And it also did not happen, at, like, that's the other thing, right? It didn't just happen. Mm -hmm. Like, this just didn't, right? Like, we didn't just wake up and we're here. Right. Um, movement ebbs and flows. And if we're doing our job right, each flow is building on the last one, That's right? right? It, the, the, so when I like when I'm talking about what happens in Palestine, I talk about this iteration of genocide, this iteration of resistance. When we're talking about the work around police terror, you know, I, and it, this iteration started January first, two thousand and nine. But before that, right, we had the work that came out of the Rodney King 
um, beatings and rebellions. Before that, we had the work of the Black Panther Party, right? And so we have to understand that, that it's building blocks. And um, it really is a testament, right, to, to I guess it's sort of a cliche saying, right, the, the, the there ain't no power like the power of the people, and the power of the people don't stop. And we don't, generation after generation after generation. Um, and I think, you know, you, you mentioned that part of the conversation is about spirituality, too. When I look at the children that are being born into the world right now, mm. when I look at my daughter and her friends, that all of my daughter's male friends, and my daughter just turned 18, identify as feminists. Mm. Or if I sit and I listen to them talk, right, and um, how much further along the road than we ever were that they are on climate, on gender, on uh, all of the isms, on capitalism, on the lie of the American, right? Like, they're just so clear. And, and I think that that really is a combination of, right, I was raised by a warrior woman. I raised my daughter. Um, as a warrior woman, and the universe and the natural evolution of us getting closer and closer to actually who Creator intends for us to be. That's right. That's right. Of that, and, you know, as a Muslim, as a Chinese Muslim, as an artist, my faith is so intertwined with my spirituality, and the work in the community is very much part of my faith you know and i as an artist and i think that's why um interfaith movement for human integrity for this love over fear campaign has invited artists so we can all connect these isms and movements and you know as one you know being a muslim i i am inspired by the third world liberation front the anti-vietnam war the black panther party and their relationship with the red guard uh party we in the history of Oakham were very much connected and just the term Asian American was is was rooted in solidarity and in relationships. And so I do have to ask you as a fellow artist, as a woman artist, I'm gonna ask you about your artistry. Um, you are an amazing theater actress, a poet, playwright. How has being an artist guided your work. Um, yeah, and how does that help you? Because I know as a woman doing this work, it's not easy. It can be very challenging, but I know for me, art has helped me while doing the work in the community. How has it helped you? Matt, so, okay, this is where I want to start. So I've got, I've got a partner in creative crime, Dr. Ayodele Nzinga, Oakland's first poet laureate, uh, founder of the Lower Bottom. Player, we're the oldest black theater company uh, in Oakland. Um, Dr. Nzinga, though, she says before she took her first breath, God whispered in her ear, make art. So I stole that. And I said, before I took my first breath, God whispered in my right ear, make art, and in my left ear, make revolution. And I've spent my entire life doing both. Um, I, I, can also, I love yeah, absolutely, it. <laughs> absolutely. It, 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 that's a free for all. Um, and then when I was, you know, in elementary school, I said, you know, I mentioned that I lost my father to the Crossville State. And so, you know, all of the things that happen to kids when that happens. And I was very lucky. I had a teacher that rather than criminalize me and push me out uh, of, you know, educational opportunity, saw something in me and told my mother about this, um, this children's theater conservatory called the Rainbow Company. And um, my mother dropped me off there to audition for The Wiz. I think it was like nine. Um, and I got cast as a munchkin. And, and, um, and that, that was it um, for me. And I would not be here. Um, and that doesn't mean that I walked a straight and narrow path because that's if and not what happened. But whenever I got too close to the cliff, right, um, I had rehearsal or I had a production or I had something to write or I, I am here because art saved my life. In terms of the movement, what I'm so clear about, right, like a lot of times we really fuck up as organizers because we invite the artist in after. So we do all the planning of the event and they're like, oh, will you come spit a poem? As opposed to understanding art as an organizing strategy, right? We do the same thing with communications, right? Communications as an organizing strategy. Our healing practitioners, they are part of the organizing strategy and we all need to be at the table at the same time. 
the power of art to tell stories and have conversations, right? Not everybody's going to come listen to me scream, fuck the police on the corner of 14th and Broadway. But if I can get you into a black box theater and, 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 and do my production, Natasha, about the, the 2015 murder of Natasha McKenna in the Fairfax, right? Now we're having a different conversation. Now I'm inciting you, activating you, engaging you in a different way. And, and we've, we've had this like, um, so but the, my public safety policy when I ran for mayor in 2018 was reimagine public safety. That's now something that, that we say that all over the world. When I think about the role of artists, right? Because we are talking about reimagining. Right, we are talking about building a world that we actually haven't seen. Mm. We actually have no idea what that looks like. When people, I, and people are like, "So when you when we reach the goal of abolition, what does that look?" I don't fucking know. Mm. I have no idea what that looks like. Like I can talk about the value, but I don't know what that that looks like in practice. But you know who can help us see the world we're trying to build? Artists. They can paint about it. They can sing about it. They can write about it. They can improv about mm. it. Right? They help us visualize the world that we are trying to get to. Um, and so they, they are not an afterthought. We are not an afterthought. We are the visionaries, actually, um, of what we're all in these streets fighting for. Um, and so my art sustains me. I definitely see it as an organizing strategy. Um, I wish sometimes it was all I, I did. <laughs> um, one day, maybe. Um, it, it's, it's my therapy. It's an organizing strategy. It's an engagement strategy. It's a uh, impacting the public narrative strategy. Um, it's an act of healing justice. I've actually started bringing um, HJ practitioners into my theatrical work because I had this aha moment that as artists of color, we spend the vast majority of our time writing about our trauma, acting our trauma, directing our trauma, rehearsing our trauma, and then we just go home. Right. And I, I did that for five years with Tasha and I almost lost my mind. Mm -hmm. And so we started to bring HJ practitioners into the theater to help people process right, what, what comes up for them when they have these experiences. Because if, if ultimately my goal is to incite you into action with my art, but you were so traumatized walking out of the theater that you don't ever want to talk about that again, right. then what have I actually accomplished? So if we can add this extra step that allows you to move some of that stuff around and then go find an organization, a cause, a family, a human, a something to get into that's going to make it better, right, then, then we're about that business and, and we're, we're actually doing the work that, that God whispered in our ears uh, to come down and do. I love that. I'm a visual person. That the, the, the message on both sides. Of my, I love, love that. I love that. Thank you for that. Um, so yes, we art is definitely ways that we can deepen our relationship to local communities. Are there any other ways that we can connect with our neighbors and our community? We can do this work and support a movement that's based on love versus violence? What other ways do you think? Yeah, so I, I, I talk a lot about the politics of APTP and we say that our politics are rooted in that of the Black Panther Party and particularly that of Minister, Dr. Minister Huey P. Newton. And that is the practice of service. Our, our work is to be of service. Um, and that can look a bazillion ways. That can look like you know you got a single mother on your block uh, whose kid is in the house probably making ramen for dinner. What does it look like to build a relationship with their family and occasionally bring that kid some food? Um, I, I made a very conscious decision for decades to live in the hood so that I could actually get up in the morning and go to work and have conversations with the babies on their way to school. Um, it, what does it look like if if they you know we do we got trash all over Oakland? Fucking get up on Saturday morning, go pick that shit up. Mm. Um, what does it look like to walk our elders across the street, right surface? Um, we moved so far away from service, and 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 in some sectors of our movement, to be in this really self-serving, celebritized, at this point monetized place. Um, I think we've lost the idea of service, not savior service. There's a difference. Mm. Service, right, is meeting people where they are at and asking them what they need and then empowering them, right, for them to engage in their own acts of service in our communities. Yes. It's not going into a community and saying, I know what you need. You've got to do what I say and you haven't gotten to where I am politically and so you're less than what, you know, that, 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 that. You don't know I know. Mm. That's, not, that's, that's not service. 
Um, that's not organizing. That's not sustainable. Um, and it's actually just as dead. That's what white supremacy actually does and says. That's how white supremacy behaves. That's right. So service, service, service and solidarity. That's our work. However, that shows up for you. Wow. You dropped so much wisdom and gems in this conversation, folks. If you have any questions for Kat Brooks, please um, put in the comment section. Uh, wow. Yeah, it makes me think about with this work, it's not about, again, you know, telling you what to do, but giving you the inspiration, uplifting you so you can the best of who you are and you can be yourself and and passing that along i ask this to every one of my guests um, on this podcast unveiling love we did a public presentation of what love looks like we took off the veil what does love look like right now i would say a montage of service i would say a montage of all of the different bodies genders, races, religions, ages, social stratas, and all of those folks being in service to each other, to the planet, to seven generations from now, to spirit. Um, and, and, and look at this question, what inspires me yes. to serve my, I, because I love you, mm. because I love like that wasn't just like a tagline of my campaign. Like I, you know, I get I get labeled as you know hateful, and I, I, nothing could be further from the truth. I love you. Mm. I love you. And isn't it interesting? Those that love fearlessly are called haters. Yeah, it is. It's interesting. Like I, I even love, I even love my aunt. Enemies. And I know that sounds so cliche. Not that they don't make me mad, and I don't want to f people up sometimes. Right. Right. But at the end of the day, I love you too. Mm -hmm. I, wow. I love you too. I'm fighting for you too. Right. That's right. That's not helpful. Abolition means we leave no one behind. No That's one. Right. No one. No That's a hard concept to lean into, even for me, y'all. Like, don't, don't, like, I am a very flawed um, person. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, we leave no one behind. Wow. Including wow. ourselves, y'all. Something to think about. You just dropped something for everyone to really think about in doing this work. We have a question from Beth uh, Fitzer. Any advice for being in community? when mental health issues make it hard to connect or show up? Wow, great question. Uh, I mean, Beth, like, Beth knows the answer to this question, but Beth, Beth, <laughs> is, up. Um, Beth, Beth is someone that, that engages in deep service uh, of our community. Um, Thank you, Beth. Thank you. I think I, 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 the other thing that I believe in outside of service is self-determination and that we allow, allow people to determine how they want to show up or how they want to be shown up for. Um, and so, sometimes that can be super hard, right? Because we have to allow people to walk their paths. Um, so sometimes it's, it's about allowing people to determine for themselves. Um, like the only exception to that rule that I would say is like if someone's in mental health crisis and the police are there. Right, like there's no self determinant right? That then your job is to stop, to film, to follow, to advocate. Um, but if you've got a single mom with six kids and four jobs and she still can't pay her bills and she's screaming on the corner in the flatlands of East Oakland and you ask her if she, if she needs anything and she says, leave the fuck alone, I'm gonna stand here and scream. Let her scream because a lot of times we're responding because we're uncomfortable. <laughs> and it's very much about us. And that actually what would actually serve the person or the community that's in crisis in that moment. So checking that for ourselves also. Absolutely. I thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Kat, I thank you everybody. You are such a busy woman and you found a schedule to chat with us. Oh, I've pleasure. learned so much 
just from your work in this conversation. Thank you everyone for being patient in the beginning as we were trying to work through the challenges of technology, you know, but- We got her done, we got her done. Um, we got it done. And Kat, if you can do me a favor and save this live uh, by chat. See, now, now we, now you asking me to do stuff. And <laughs> yeah. Y'all know me and the technology is not a, is not a thing. I'm, I'm going to figure it out though. Uh, so if I click on the X, will it give me the option to save it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You're going to have to like, you know, slow for slow down for it to pop up and then you just um, save it. And then, um, I think you can collaborate with the faith to yeah, make one of us. I think I can also, I'm going to send, what, what is your I? Cause I can't see it now. I, uh, I am in the number four, uh, -huh. uh, and then human intelligence. Human. Um, yeah, I am and then four human integrity guys. You guys seeing real life collaboration through. <laughs> All right, so I sent it to you just in case oh. I mess it up, and then I'll close this and I'll save it. You all have a good weekend. I love you all. I love you. Love you, Kat. Thank you for your leadership and for the inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Peace, y'all. Uh -huh.